peace of the Lord be with you. Welcome as we dig back into our, our journey through the book of Romans. For this, the 10th Sunday after Pentecost, from Romans 9, 1 to 5. I always find this such an interesting um, pericope. Um, pericope being the, the, the fancy old word for 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 scripture lesson, that the way it's divided up. Because it's it almost seems like it leaves you hanging. And perhaps... Perhaps that's done intentionally along the way because, you know, we, we, we don't really have a huge argument that we can trace from beginning to end in the way in which Paul is writing. But, but he's, he's talking about um, his, his, own, his own struggles um, being this, this preacher of the gospel where he ended up being um, not only commissioned by the apostles in the early church to become this apostle to the Gentiles, but then also looking back at his own training and his background, being um, solidly trained um, within within Judaic thought. He was trained as a Pharisee and all of these kinds of things, which he describes in other ones, uh, other of his letters. But but here it, it talks about his anguish um, on behalf of the people of Israel who who um, closed their ears to the preaching of the message of, of Christ. And as we listen to it, there, there's some, um, some deep spiritual insights for ourselves where, you know, as we take a look at not only the way in which um, within our own day and age, children, grandchildren wander away from the faith so easily, family members wander away from the faith because they they shut their hearts um, to, to that preaching and that gospel message to, to Christ ultimately. Um, and, and then what we do, what we do. Um, we're not the first to, to wrestle with that kind of an anguish. And, and um, hearing these words from Paul becomes... Um, this this um, almost cathartic, but also this good good reflection on our own lives and the way in which Paul doesn't give up um, in the same way that you know we shouldn't give up praying for them and all of these kinds of things. But but in the midst of it, um, you know, even when we face those those same kinds of struggles and anguish within our own society in our own day. Um, it, it, it becomes one of these things where we have comfort from um, that body, that community of saints that we have all through our baptism into Christ. So Romans chapter 9, starting at verse 1, let's open with a word of prayer. Lord, Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you for not only the, the content of the scriptures in terms of the, the, the very real content that is there within the way Paul writes about it, that pattern of sound teaching of who Christ is what he has done for us, what God's will for us is, and all of these kinds of things. But then also the insights into our own struggles of faith, um, even as we wrestle through our own anguish and grief. Bless us as we step into these words from Paul, so that um, not only that we would learn from one of the, the greatest preachers of the Christian church, um, and, and certainly the the most most prolific of the writers in the New Testament, but also Help us to, to recognize your comfort even in the midst of our own struggles and our own grief um, as we look at our own families and our children and the world around us. All this we pray for in the name of Jesus, your Son, and we say, Amen. So Romans 9, verses 1 to 5. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit. Um, Paul begins a number of times throughout his letters with phrases like this, where, where he does have to assert um, you know, these things along the way, because Paul received a lot of flack from, from um, not only the early Jewish community, because he was one of these, these, um, the, these grand um, Pharisees, and um, the way he started as Saul, he was this, this kind of a, a you know, a, this, this rising figure, a rising star within the Judaic community, trying to get rid of these Christians, stamping them out, because, you know, he, he was going from community to community to have them thrown into jail and have them stoned and all of these kinds of things along the way. So that um, he received flack both from within the Jewish community that you really don't care for your people anymore. You know, these sorts of things. It's like, look at you, you turned your back on us and those kinds of things. Um, which which would have been heart-wrenching for him, um, as, as we find out here as well. But then also from within the church where it's like, well, yeah, that was the guy that formerly persecuted us. And can we really trust him as a preacher and all of these sorts of things along the way? 
And, and, you know, and then when he went on the way he did throughout the book of Romans saying, you know, it's not by the works of the law that we're saved and the way he writes in his other letters, you know, with all of those different sorts of festivals and things, they have a shape of wisdom, but they really don't have any substance to them anymore because in Christ, all of those are fulfilled and we have the fullness in Christ. So you had both outside of the church from within the, the, um, the, the Jewish community, um, a lot of, a lot of shade thrown Paul's way, um, to the point where, you know, he was thrown into jail. People tried to stone him, <coughs> all those kinds of things. But then even within the church, um, where, you know, you read through his other letters and some of the letters he has to really, um, you know, um, not not only step carefully, but step decisively in order to point out that this is not something that I take great delight in, and giving you these instructions to try and 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 bring you, you know, um, not not so much that he doesn't delight in bringing the people together, but that having to deal um, more directly and more harshly at times with with the sins and the legalism of people on the one hand where they keep trying to say well no it's it's jesus but and all of these things from the old testament so that you know just like in, in our modern day and age you get movements that that try to claim oh we've rediscovered this old testament passage no we haven't forgotten the old testament passages which talk about you know worship on the sabbath day it's saturday but you know in the new testament the church worships on the day of the resurrection the first day of the week and, and Paul reminds us that our Sabbath rest comes in Christ, all of these kinds of things along the way. Um, even Peter, you know, all of these sorts of things when he had that vision of the sheet coming down and all these creepy crawly things that would make you unclean if you ate them. And then this voice from heaven says, kill and eat. He says, never, Lord, never have I done anything that would make me unclean. And then three times it comes down. And then as it goes up, don't declare unclean what I have declared clean. And then the Holy Spirit leads him, Peter, into that that um, conversation with with this this Roman Gentile family, and and then he observes and see, sees, as the Lord provides the Holy Spirit and the same gift of tongues, that yes, indeed, these people have been brought into that same family of faith by the same Jesus through the same gift of baptism. Who can prevent them from being baptized? You know, the New Testament has all of these teachings there, but as we take a look and as we listen to it, you know, um, even in our own day, we have the same basic struggles, and they are theological struggles, where people want to run with society. And what do you mean? Because, you know, God and the Bible are just downers on what society wants to do, and it always has been. Always has been. Even in the Old Testament, where, you know, the prophets were sent in order to remind the people of Israel the many times that they messed up along the way or were sent into exiles because of your sins. Um, you know, return unto me is the word return. Come back. Come back. Um, but then the other side is, is as we take a look at it, even within the church, um, sometimes, you know, and, and this, this is where Paul is always this good person to read through there's this temptation to become complacent because it's like okay we're good we're good we're good we're good don't really listen anymore don't really grow don't really learn we're good we just go through the motions um you know paul points to both of those as problems he faced flack because of both of those in the same way that you know even within churches and there's no perfect congregation that wasn't in the new testament either or Paul would have to go into churches in order to to you know set things straight, stop grumbling, stop fighting. You two, some you know, uh, you know, he names a couple of ladies that were known to be fighters in one one of his letters and say, "Can be reconciled to one another." Come on, this is enough. Um, calls people up by name for for certain things along the way too, not in order to embarrass them, but in order to say, "Come on, it's time to time to come and be part of the whole." Same things happen within churches here today, and um, there's no denomination um, that, that ex is exempt from that. But as we listen to Paul, um, and I think today as we listen to this particular passage, um, it, it's good to recognize not only, you know, the way he felt like he was caught between a rock and a hard place, certainly going back to that, that um, Romans 7 passage where, you know, where he unfolds and says that you know even though we're born from adam we're reborn in christ in baptism and so we've got this new gift and yet we continue to struggle with this 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 brokenness so the things that i know that i should do that the holy spirit is guiding and leading me in through the word i end up not doing it and i do all the things that i shouldn't do who's going to rescue me from this body of death um 
you know, all of this is combined together with the ways in which, um, you know, he he's stuck in a rock between a rock and a hard place, not only within himself, but you know, spurred on by the devil and the society around him. What do you do? He struggles. He struggles. We sit in basically the same kind of a spiritual space throughout our lives where we wrestle and struggle, some of us more so than others, granted, but at the same time that struggle is there. And as we listen to this, you know, so the way Paul begins, he begins by pointing out, um, I'm telling the truth in Christ, okay? All these rumors, all of this gossip, all of this bubbling things that people are going to say, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm being honest with you here, he's saying, basically saying. I'm not lying. Um, my conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit. And so he's, he's trying, to, trying to unfold, um, open up his heart, be vulnerable before the congregation. That I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. And heart is not the way in which, um, you know, we talk nowadays like, like Valentine's Day. The heart where love, love, um, this is the grand thing that flows out of it. Heart is um, from the core of who he is, which is a unique part of both Hebrew and Greek way of talking about it. The heart is the core underneath which emotions and mind and memory and will all emerge and arise. It's that center which um, so often we, we um, deceive ourselves by not taking the time to look at that. Um, we just chase after whatever is on the surface of our, our, our psychological makeup. Well, here Paul basically says, right out of the core, out of the center of who he is, you know, he's torn with anguish and grief. Why? Verse 3, For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Um, and, and basically he's saying, you know, kinsmen according to the flesh. Who is that? descendants of Israel, um, which was is being divided here where you've got some that are, you know, are following the promises and and all of the fulfillment of all of those things along the way so that in Christ we have the fullness of the promises that were made to not only Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, to Noah, to Abraham, to David, and all of these things fulfilled in the death and resurrection of Christ, but then you have all of these others that are um, basically turning their back on this. His own people and community is getting torn apart over this. And, and, and he's basically saying they're accursed because they're turning their back on the one through whom all blessings flow. And he says, I wish I could be cursed so that they could come in. If only, if only. He's torn to the heart. And as, as we listen to this, you know, it might be something, like I said before, we ourselves wrestle with as we take a look at our family members. So he says, they are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption. Okay, God chose them, sort of like what we heard last week in the Deuteronomy reading. You are a people holy to the Lord because I have chosen you, not because you were grand and great in number, but because of my love and my promise and my covenant and my oath that I swore to you and your fathers. So they are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory tied to that, the covenants, what we heard last week on, 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 on the Old Testament reading. In other words, all of the agreements that God made and all of the promises that he made to them that through them there would be the savior of the world. Through them, the life, or the giving of the law, Mount Sinai, the worship, okay, all of the worship tied to the temple worship, which was a precursor and a foreshadowing of Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the world, you know, the, the sins of the world. And then the promises, all of these sorts of things. Um, to them belong the patriarchs. Okay, so Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then all of the others that are listed along the way. So to them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, from the Israelites, according to the flesh, According to the flesh and God's promises, is the Christ who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. In, in, in this passage, like I said, that's where it ends. But as we listen to it, this becomes one of those where as we hear it, we kind of think that he's going to go on and he's going to build more and he's got more to say along the way. But that's where this particular pericope ends. And I think the wisdom of the, the, the crafters of the lectionary is that 
we end there, both to point out not only who is Jesus and where did he come from and where is he tied to, especially the way we connected to the Old Testament reading from last week, but then as we hear this and as we consider how Paul is anguished and torn apart, yet in the middle of it, where do we turn? And the only place we can go is to Christ Jesus, our Lord, because it is with him, through him, to him, in his flesh, that God has fulfilled all of these promises, all of this grand history, which in and of itself is nothing because it all points to Christ, where we need to stand. Um, and, and this is where, you know, as we wrestle and struggle with the way in which our world is going and the way it goes, and it's like, what are we going to do? And then the way in which congregations worry, we see our youth and our young adults and everybody moving and leaving and nobody's really interested in church. And then along the way, as we take a look at, you know, volunteerism within society, which has gone down the toilets all around. And so we shouldn't be surprised if we find the problems in the church as well. But then, you know, it's like, okay, who's going to step into these positions to make sure churches function and run and all of these kinds of things. And we panic. Um, and yet in the midst of all of this, in the midst of that grief, um, you know, we're no different than St. Paul was. And what are we called to do? Stand in Christ. Live in Christ. Live in that baptismal grace. Witness to Christ. Don't give up on the real promise. Just in order to look like you fit in, thinking that that's somehow going to build the church. Because if the church is built on a wrong foundation, then the church is going to fall. Build on Christ, who is God over all. Notice he says God over all. Does he talk about Jesus as divine? Yes, he does. And blessed forever. In whom, through baptism, we share in every single one of those eternal blessings that God has prepared for us in him. So, pray. Let your tears be an opportunity to return to the Lord, to return to your baptism, to be able to return and carry all of you know, our loved ones and the world around us before him as we grieve the, well, the way in which people turn their backs on Christ. Um, because along the way, those prayers and those tears are never lost. They're never lost. But rejoice and stand on Christ, our cornerstone. Amen.